but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of his age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit of the Spirit, through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within. So also no one comprehends what is truly God, God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. Word of God, word of life. Please stand to welcome the gospel. The gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt had lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Hid, sorry. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine for others so that they may see your good work and give your glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, I will never attend I will nev- you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, gentlemen. Please be seated. Nicely done. Thank you. It's nice to hear the word from you today. Grace to you and peace from God, our creator, Christ, our savior, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer. Amen. Many years ago, I was feeling really bad, really down. Things were just not working out in my life at all. In my relationships, in my work life, and my parents had both recently died, and I was just feeling really beaten up by life. And so I was talking to a person that I still see today every now and then. She's my coach. She's a pastor, but she functions as sort of a spiritual coach. And she said to me, as I was saying, you know, I'm just failing at everything and I feel horrible and I feel lousy. And she said to me, Stephanie, you have no idea how powerful you really are. And I was like, powerful, please. (laughs) Right. And she went on to say that as a daughter of God, I had this power in me that I was essentially unaware of. Now, years later, I know that she was absolutely right. And so if the sermon has any title at all, it is a title for you. As a daughter, as a son of God, you have no idea how powerful you are. Babies know this. Babies are born knowing that they're the center of the universe, and they're awesome. They smile, they enjoy themselves, except when people aren't paying attention to them or if they're hungry and they know they should be getting attention. And so they cry and they let their presence be known. They are powerful. They have a light given to them by God and they let that light shine. And you better take notice. Babies understand this straight from God that they are. And yet as children grow, they, we often hear from our well-meaning parents, Sunday school teachers, pastors, teachers, We hear, don't be so selfish. It's not just about you, it's about the whole group. Don't let your light shine quite so brightly. Dull and dim your light just a little bit. Have some self-control. Know when to have manners. Know when to stay quiet. Know how to obey orders. And all of that is right and good, of course, for good order. 
We wouldn't want a classroom full of children running wild, doing whatever they felt like. We need to have some good order, as our Boy Scouts are clearly showing, knowing good order as they've been raised this way. But unfortunately, what can come with that sometimes, from all of us well-meaning adults, is a message to kids, dull your light just a little bit. Don't let your light shine quite so brightly. That's what many of us, anyway, have internalized. And that can lead to shame. And yet Jesus tells us this morning, as Jesus speaks to his disciples, and we know we're his disciples too, so this is a message to us too, Jesus tells us, don't put your light under some kind of a bushel basket. Don't dim your light. Don't do it. We teach this to preschoolers. You know that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine, right? You know that song? Let me see your light. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. All right, you do know the song. And one of those verses is, hide it under a basket. No, I'm gonna let it shine, right? We don't let anybody blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus wants us to let our light shine. He doesn't say just the adults or just the kids. He doesn't say just the males or just the females. He doesn't say just the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious people of the day, or just the people who aren't them. He's talking to all of us. Let it shine. That is a mandate. And yet, he doesn't tell us how to ignite the fire, how to make the spark get bigger, how to have a light in the first place. He doesn't tell us where to go purchase a light, how to apply for a light, how to stand in line and hope we get the right lottery number that's picked for the light. He goes at it assuming that we already have it. He knows we already have the light innately put there by our creator. He doesn't tell us to create the light, to produce the light, to even make it brighter. He just tells us not to hide it, not to hide under the basket that which we already have. So we don't have to work at being good enough, intelligent enough, accomplished enough, beautiful enough, worthy enough somehow to have the light. You know, I told you last week how much I love the Academy Awards and I love movies in general. Today, those people on the red carpet are going to hope that they have that something that's going to let their light shine. They're going to hope that the journalists and the photographers will make note of them that they will be written up that they're wearing the right gown or they have the right haircut or something to shine. They're going to hope that they get given that award for best picture or best actor or actress. They're going to hope that they can shine in the eyes of their fans. And God's like, you know, you don't have to work so hard. I mean, it's awesome to get all those accolades and awards, but whether they win or they lose, they have the light of God, which is so much better than any other light that any other person can give you any other respect somebody else can give you, or even written up in a newspaper or given something shiny to put on your shelf. You have the light of God already, and Jesus says, just try not to dim it or dull it a bit, because that's what we're capable of. We're not capable of creating the light. We're not capable of making it shine. God did that. But we are capable of dulling and dimming it. We are capable of saying no to that light that God first gave us. Here are a few ways we do that. I thought of four different ways that we, human beings, often dull our own light. First of all, we dull our own light out of fear. We're afraid that people won't get us because the way I shine, we think, isn't understood by all of the population. And that's absolutely true. I'm not going to be one to stand up here and tell you that everybody's going to get you. The statistic is that 8 to 10% of the population flat out won't even like you or me. It's the way it is. You could talk about your favorite restaurant in the whole world, and at least 8 to 10% of the population won't like it. You can talk about your favorite movie, your favorite TV show, your favorite food, your favorite music, your favorite anything, and at least 8 to 10% of the population won't like you. Look what happened to Jesus. Did everybody like him? Did everybody get him, God of the universe that he was? So we might as well accept it 
that 8 to 10% of the population, not just people that we don't know across the planet, but in our circles, won't either like us or understand us. Okay, that's the deal. When we know that that's the deal, we can get about the business of shining anyway. The way you particularly shine is a marching order that God gave you to give your particular imprint, your particular gifts, your particular ability to this world. And the world is impoverished if you don't do it. The world needs you or you wouldn't have been born. The world needs your way of shining, which is different than your neighbor's way of shining, and not everybody will understand you. So if we can know that, then we can be maybe a little less afraid and do it anyway. Courage is not having no fear. Courage is having fear and still going forward with what you know you're called to be and do in this world. The second reason we often dull our light is comparison. We go, well, I mean, I can shine a little bit, but I I don't shine like that person. And if you think I'm exempt from this, I know who Billy Graham is. Dr. Martin Luther King and other incredible preachers. We all can compare ourselves to other people. We all can go, well, I'm a dancer, but I'm not a dancer like that dancer. I'm an actress, but not like her. I'm a scholar, but I don't have, you know, Oxford degrees and all the people signing up to get my classes banging down my door. We can all compare ourselves to others, every last one of us. However, it's interesting when you turn that on its head. Instead of letting comparison stop you, Use comparison to take a clue as to what you're called to do and be. Let me give you a for instance. I can see incredible astronauts and feel zero envy because I don't want to be an astronaut and I'm not called to be. I can see an incredible accountant and have zero envy. That's not my particular calling. But when I feel envy that Billy Graham packs the house, that's a clue because I'm called to do something of that. Something. Because I'm in ministry like him, right? Use comparison as a clue when it hurts you, when you want to be bigger, better, stronger, bolder, whatever it is. Don't let it hurt so much as fill you in as to what perhaps God is calling you to do and be. Maybe something in that field. Maybe something along those lines. If you're envious of missionaries, if you're envious of writers, if you're envious of explorers. You know, my husband for many years talked about how Indiana Jones just led him on, not so much to be an explorer in foreign lands, but to be a professor. Use that envy, use that light to move forward into what you're called to do and be and how your light can shine in this world. Another reason we sometimes dim our own light is because of our own sadness. We have all had things that have been profoundly painful to us. We have all had things that have broken our hearts. We have all had things that have wounded us, maybe even abused us. We have all had grief and loss. The first thing you need to do with all of that is face it. Look at it. Write about it. See a therapist. See a pastor. There is zero shame in taking care of your mental health or your spiritual well-being. Just like there is zero shame in taking care of your physical health. And if you had a problem physically, you'd go to a doctor. There's no shame in that. We need to break the stigma of shame with depression, mental health situations, and going to see a therapist or a pastor if you need it. There's nothing wrong with that. Take care of it by looking at it. What are you sad about? What's hurting you? Write about it. Talk to a friend. Talk to somebody who can help you. Work it out. And don't stop there. Eventually, the point is healing so that you're not just talking about that all day, every day. Kind of like this. If I went to a salad bar and I saw all of the options that I could put on my salad, and let's say, for instance, that I can't stand mushrooms. But let's say I liked cucumbers and tomatoes and everything else they had there. Imagine me standing by the mushrooms going, I can't stand mushrooms. Why don't they get this off the salad bar? Excuse me, manager, get these mushrooms off the salad bar. And spending all my time there all about the mushrooms. How about I just forget the mushrooms and keep going with what I do like on my salad? 
putting the things on that I want in my life instead of focusing constantly on what makes me angry and what I don't like and the sadness in my life constantly. So I'm not saying don't deal with it. Please deal with it and find some healing so that that sadness, that narrative of loss and pain and anger and betrayal is not the only thing you focus on. Get your attention off of the mushrooms and on to things you love about this life. Or your light will be dimmed. And then lastly, I think the other way we don't let our light shine, we dim our light, is just simply a lack of putting time into our relationship with God. Like with any relationship, relationship takes time. It takes nurturing. It takes growth and commitment, spending time together. I'm like that with my husband and my kids and with all of you. If I never saw you, what would our relationship be like? Relationships take time. Now, you know, hopefully, by sermons I've said that God loves you 100%, entirely crazy in love with you, done deal. So you're not in a relationship to try to earn God's love. You've got it. You're not in a relationship to try to earn salvation. You've got it. Salvation was done. That kind of healing was done by virtue of what happened on the cross. You're in relationship in order for you to let your light shine, to feel close to God, to feel the love of God that God always has there for you, to know where God wants you to go and what to do and what to be in this lifetime, even though the 8 to 10% of the population won't get it. When you are filled with God's love for you, with messages for you, with particular care for you, through prayer, through scripture, through meditation, through worship, then you will feel naturally like your light can shine. It won't even be something you strive and struggle so hard to do. You just will stop dimming it. You'll stop dimming it because you'll be more aware of how much God loves you. I went to a conference this last week, and the focus was on evangelism. Now, by evangelism, that's not about being obnoxious. Sometimes that word gets, you know, misused, I think. Like we're standing on a street corner yelling through a bullhorn that everybody's damned for all time unless they do whatever. That, that's so far not what I'm talking about. So hear me, please. In our denomination, we're called the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Evangelical is from a Greek word, euangelios or euangelion, which means good news. It's just about good news. How do we share the good news that we have, or we wouldn't be here in this sanctuary if anybody didn't share it with us, how do we share the good news to those who so much need it? How do we do that? At this conference, they talked about evangelism being a matter of the spirit, a matter of our own spiritual vitality that wants to then go out and help others. And I would like all of you to help me do this because I need it. I need the help from all of you. We often don't evangelize because we're afraid. We feel like we don't have the right words, we don't know what to say, or we don't evangelize because we believe more in providence, which means that God will do whatever God does, and it doesn't matter what we say or do. God will just do whatever God does. But I'd like for us to get more in the game with this. I'd like for us to remember what it meant to us that somebody invited us to church. Remember what it meant to us that our parents or our grandparents or our friends told us about the love of Christ for the first time. I want us to think about what our lives would be like if we did not know how much God loves us and imagine that there are other people out there in this community that feel that way too. They don't know. They are lost and broken and hurting and have no idea that the God of the universe is crazy in love with them. I want us to want to give this away to our neighbors in need. And also Jesus mandated for us to do this. Evangelism is just simply helping people, God, helping people discover God's unmerited grace and love for them in however creative ways we do that. What does success look like? It does not look like Millions of people liking our evangelism. They might, they might not. Success looks like, success is, making the evangelistic effort. That's it. That's how to be successful in evangelism, that you make the effort. 
So this week, what I'd like you to do is to help me on this. When you're out with your friends, when you're at your school or workplace, you're in your neighborhood, I would like you just once this week, just once, mention the name of your church and something you like about it, anything. Just mention it. Let's start getting comfortable doing that. Like we mention our favorite movies or restaurants. Just mention your church and the name of it and anything you like about it. Become comfortable with that. Or if you want to go a little bit further, you might even mention a little bit of your own faith story of which you are the expert. You're the expert of your faith story. You might want to talk a little bit about that. Remember, though, throughout this whole thing that the light is already within you. So you don't need to worry. You'll be given the words to say, and you will be successful just by making the effort. The light is already within you, and so let's see what happens. I invite you now to pray with me. Would you take a moment now to thank God that someone told you about the light of Christ, told you the gospel story. Thank God for that person or those people in your life. Would you take a moment to thank God for filling you with the light of Christ that you don't have to put there? You don't even have to make stronger. God gives you an eternal supply of this light, and thank God for that light. Would you ask God to help you find more ways to let your light shine boldly for his glory for the good of all who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.